Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Peter Robinson and this is the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup. Today we've got Oliver from Zelic and he's going to talk about blockchain auditing. So Oliver, um, please introduce yourself. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, so yeah, um, my name is Oliver. Um, I am an ex-financial engineer. Um, so I used to build programs that price derivatives, stimulated markets, and aggregated portfolios uh, for modeling collateral exchanges. Uh, very well-suited background for DeFi. Um, at Zelic, I used to audit cool projects um, like algorithmic stablecoins uh, on Move and Solana, lending platforms, um, and financial NFTs on Ethereum, and a bunch of infrastructure-type contracts. Now, most of my time is spent on the sales side, where I'm talking to founders and developers. So with that, um, maybe I'll get into the, the talk, um, start off with the agenda. So today we're going to discuss the audit process from start to finish. The goal is to help builders select service providers and help them prepare for the audit process. We'll discuss different types of audit processes, the business models and work environments that support them, getting ready for an audit and what happens after an audit. At a high level, smart contract auditing can effectively be grouped into the following main categories. Automated, automated approaches, top-down approaches, formal verification, and manual code review and economically oriented audits. So these approaches are not mutually exclusive, but I'll just use this as a frame that's useful for separating key points between them. Starting off with automated approaches. Um, Slither is really the main tool that we see here used on the EVM side. Basically, we can code up a bug signature and memory and run an algorithm to search for it on Solidity files. So this is really the most limited form of an audit that we see out there. And bug searches are typically confined to simple coding mistakes and single function scopes. Um, the hit rate for finding bugs in these algorithms is also fairly limited. So even if a bug is there, it can be missed. And in the past, this has resulted in scenarios where teams have run these tools and they think they're safe. Um, and unfortunately, it turns out that that's not always the case. Another type of auditing approach, sort of the, ne the next one up, is the um, our top-down approaches. They require more skill than automated approaches. And basically how they work is auditors have a list of known exploits they are concerned about, and they need to be trained in identifying them in the different ways that they might appear across protocols. So like the automated tooling approach, it suffers from a major drawback, which is that they are primarily reactive in the sense that the bug types need to be known beforehand. Formal verification is another form of smart contract auditing. And there are benefits to formal verification that no other approach can really match. So we can isolate the specific behavior of a smart contract, um, isolate a specific behavior that is, um, and these are typically called invariants, and demonstrate that under no circumstance or the specific circumstance under which this behavior will be violated. So as an example of an invariant, in a recent blog post uh, by Zelik, we show that there is only one possible scenario in which the accounting balances of WETH9 uh, could be broken. And this was actually a pretty neat discovery that nobody was aware of at the time. So I'm happy to share that blog post at the end of the talk here. Um, but there are some strong limitations to the form of verification approach. So it takes a lot of resources. We basically need to replicate the business logic of the protocol in another language which kind of raises an interesting question, uh, which is sort of like who audits the auditor's formal verification program. And another challenge is that it can really only be applied, um, maybe not so much in theory, but at least in practice from what I've seen to um, quite simple invariance, that is behaviors. The best form of smart contract auditing is uh, in my opinion anyways, is the, uh, is the manual code review. And this is a combination of bottom-up and top-down approaches. So on the top-down side, you want 
highly experienced auditors who regularly review bug libraries and look for a wide range of known bugs in code, not just a select handful. On the bottom up side, it's about approaching the protocol with a fresh set of eyes, um, a beginner's mindset, if you will, to sort of borrow a term that's commonly used um, in yoga. So everything needs to be passed through the filter of the cr critical thought process. Um, and evenly, seemingly safe looking code or familiar code cannot be taken for granted. But, you know, like all approaches, nothing is foolproof um, and it's never possible to find 100% of all the bugs. At Zelic, our process for um, the bottom of approach works like this. So we start off with low level functions and move up to high level functions. And the key concerns are, we need to know what are the parameters, states, inputs that need to be validate, validated for a function call. Uh, these are called the preconditions. Um, we also need to ask, what are the outputs and state changes made after function call is successfully made? These are called post conditions. This process of examining preconditions and post conditions follows an iterative flow from low level to high level functions and ultimately encompasses protocol wide business logic. After we've sort of done that first iteration or that first pass through, we iterate. We like, like to take that understanding that we've now sort of obtained from the protocol um, at a holistic level and then go back to the very beginning and start off with low level functions. We're going to have a better understanding of the overall state of the contract and the implications of function calls um, that are made for the rest of the protocol. So one of the things we focus on in high order functions is called branch coverage. So depending on the values of the parameters passed in or the state of the contract when a function is called, the flow of a program control and high order functions can take different routes. So what I mean by different routes is basically you can have those lower order functions or internal functions be called by the higher order functions depending on parameters and contract state. Comprehensively capturing this is called branch coverage and is something we spend a lot of time focusing on. We have a very standardized process to help our auditors um, work through and document this process. The key objectives in this more standardized process is to eliminate bugs at the function level and build a model for tacking bugs at the protocol level. At the end of applying this standard operating procedure for branch coverage, we should know the main functioning of the protocol, key state variables, and how the user interactions can influence state. And then we can start the more creative process of searching for sets of user interactions that can, can exploit state um, and can lead to things like loss of funds or denial of service. Yeah. So if there's any questions sort of after that initial section, I'd be happy to hear them. Um, and then I'll sort of like continue on with like this next section. Um, Oliver. Sure. What, um, but you mentioned formal verification. What verification tools are you using? So formal verification, like we use like SMT checker to like set up the equations. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, primarily, primarily that. I'm not actually an expert when it comes to fair for formal verification. Um, my experience is more on the manual code, manual code side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, a question from me, what do you, have you used any AI tools, you know, chat GPT or others? Um, and you know, what, what are your findings on using them to try and audit code? Yeah. So Steven, our CEO and founder actually did a blog post investigating chat GPT for searching for bugs. And I definitely think sort of in some cases you can use it to find sort of um, similar to how you would use something like Slither um, to find sort of like bugs isolated to a single function um, and maybe sort of more well-known coding mistakes. But I definitely see there being quite a few limitations on capturing any bugs that would sort of present themselves more at the protocol level. So any sort of more of like the cooler economic or business logic based 
exploits that we often see. Um, but happy to hear other people's views on that. Yeah, I'm doing a talk on the topic um, in about um, two weeks' time, so just interested to hear what you've got to say. I can see Frank's got his hand up. So, Frank, over to you for a question. Yeah, so I've got a question related to um, repeatability and maintainability. So you do your uh, manual auditing process and so on, mm -hmm. and then you change the code a tiny bit. Uh, do you have to redo the analysis from scratch or can you perform some incremental checks? So how do we handle that situation as a firm? Yeah, how do you handle, I mean, you've got, a, you've done some auditing, right? Manual auditing. Mm -hmm. Then we change part of the code. How do you deal with that? Well, typically it's pretty straightforward if it's something that we've audited in the past. Um, if we've audited the complete code base, then we're going to have auditors familiar with the core business logic. When there's changes made, um, they're reflected in commits on GitHub. So it's pretty easy to track down the differences between the uh, code state that we audited uh, and the code state um, after the changes. And then it's just sort of a matter of scoping an audit that targets those differences. Um, if those differences can sort of be easy, easily modularized and separated from the core logic, um, then that's a lot easier from like an engagement standpoint. Um, but if they have sort of like protocol wide uh, implications that might alter some of the business logic or the economics of the protocol, um, then that's definitely something we want to spend more time on. Sounds good. So thank you for the. Um, so I think you can let's go skip back to the talk now. Okay, great. So I think there's probably kind of fair to say that there are um, sort of shops. Now, this isn't necessarily a term that like we came up with that might be referred to as like volume shops. Um, these are shops that sort of offer more of like the top down approaches or automated tooling based approaches to auditing. Um, sometimes they can get a bit of a bad rap, um, but they definitely serve a key niche in the market and that they allow projects to get to market fast when where they can potentially earn revenue, demonstrate market fit, and get more advanced security audits later. But it is important to highlight a few concerns with top-down approaches used by some volume shops. They sort of have um, a built-in sort of hack the risk option, if you will. So what I mean by that is if a protocol does get hacked, as long as the bug type does not fall into their search category, or you know, oftentimes these auto reports, they start with a list of the types of bug classes they're looking for, then it can be claimed like that hack was out of scope. And in some way this can have you know, negative implications for the market for audits, um, given that many protocols are not necessarily well educated on the pros and the cons of different auditing processes. So they may not be getting the signal about the potential shortcomings in the fundamental processes um, applied by these firms because the firm's name isn't necessarily tied to a hack, um, which can sort of be, um, you know, one of the key indicators that protocols can sort of use to navigate between uh, the quality of the services offered by different firms. Furthermore, sometimes the list of bugs in top-down approaches is not necessarily well aligned with the project being audited. So it is important for auditors following a top-down approach to work closely with projects to determine the appropriate classes of bugs to search for. So outside of those two, um, there's also like the formal verification audit shops. Um, and I think it's important to mention here that in our view, or in my view, um, formal verification shops are not really holistic bug hunters. Um, they are more so identifiers of key protocol behaviors that are capable of being covered through the process of formal, formal verification. So what they end up providing is an extremely high level of assurance of a specific functionality but it's important to emphasize that this process is not necessarily well suited, at least from what I've seen, um, for complicated or novel business logic. 
but it is extremely well suited for certain things that are very hard to manually audit. Um, and these, I'm definitely hoping for some more examples in the chat, but these can be things like math libraries or date and time libraries or sort of very specific functionalities like some of the, um, like the accounting balances example I gave for WETH9. So relying on formal verification alone would result in large security blind spots. And it's really best suited for larger protocols who have already had audits done and are looking to iron out the edges of their security profile. That being said, it's an area of extremely fast development um, that I'm very excited about. And I definitely think some of like the best people in the space work in this area. So the manual review shops, these are your more traditional hacker shops. Um, they do really well when auditors have sort of a combination of things in place. So rigorous procedures that have been thoughtfully put together by the audit, by the auditors. Um, at Zelic, we have around 20 engineers or so when we put together, when we were putting together SOP, uh, we had everybody contribute to it. So we would sort of all um, benefit from their unique, unique perspectives, um, you know, when coming to the creative hacking dimension of the audit. Um, so SOPs need to have sort of multiple components to them. Um, the portion of the SOP that covers known exploits, this is sort of falling more into the top-down approach. Um, we find this works best when it's supported by a firm-wise practice of recording new and novel bugs in internal bug libraries, and also ensuring that knowledge is spread throughout the firm. So when our auditors come across new bugs, um, they share them with the rest of the team. We're very active in our internal communication channels, uh, very excited to learn from what other people are doing. Um, so that's definitely sort of like, I think that's sort of like one of the fun things about working at any audit shop, uh, but I haven't worked at other audit shops, so I can't speak to how they do things there. Um, the bottom up portion of the SOP, um, like I mentioned earlier, this should definitely include sections on, on, on branch coverage. Um, and sort of, you know, within that steps to ensure that auditors are building up, you know, that really comprehensive model of the protocol, that's really going to be useful when we start to get into those, uh, protocol level exploits. So I think outside of sort of those core SOP operational considerations, um, all of this needs to be supported by the culture of the audit firms. So sometimes uh, the questions we need to ask in order to find novel bugs are really silly. Uh, so we need to have teammates that are invested in the process and non-judgmental. Um, really sort of that, that sort of seems best supported when you have a track record of success where you're working with people, you know, who have done good audits and you know that's part of their process. So um, it's easy to sort of uh, take the time away from what you're doing and sort of entertain some cool ideas. Um, we also need to work with good projects who understand that taking the seemingly contrary or weird perspectives on a protocol is uh, is key to finding its breaking points. Uh, we also see the best outcomes when, you know, and I think this applies to any industry is when we're highly motivated. Um, so I think sort of the way we think about our culture here is kind of like high performance gamers. Uh, we're trying to find as many uh, and as most important bugs as we can. Um, but that sort of fits with the, the backgrounds of the majority of the engineers here at the firm which is sort of like from the competitive hacking circuit. So we just sort of like to sort of like carry that, that lineage of competitive hacking. Um, but of course now we're all on, um, we're all on sort of one big team working together. So uh, it's definitely a cool dynamic. Um, also, you know, with any audit, um, there's a lot of mechanical aspects that need to be considered. So, you know, writing reports, um, standard procedures, you know, communication with clients, um, more sort of engagement related things. It's good to have those things sort of modulized across different um, supporting supporting uh, groups within the team. Okay, so if there's any questions about that last section, uh, I'd be happy to hear them. Yeah, over to you, Frank, for a question. Yeah, so I've got a question related to um, uh, the idea of finding bugs or uh, let's say um, behaviors that are not intended. 
it, it should be defined. I mean, the the, uh, the specification of the system should guide you to define what are the intended behaviors and what are the unintended behaviors. So uh, when you, you're looking for, how do you define a bug actually? What, how do you define it when you look for something in the code? How do you end up saying, oh, that's a bug? What are the, the, the reasons you would say, oh, that's, that's a bug? Re with respect to what, what, what specification does it violate? So that's the question I have. So there's probably a couple of ways of answering this. Um, I think the most obvious answer would be um, there are certain types of behaviors that any protocol developer is not going to want to have, um, such as draining funds from an account or being able to perform a denial of service attack. Outside of that, and this is sort of something we'll get into um, in terms of preparing for an audit, um, is having a good documentation from the protocol in terms of what that expected behavior um, of the protocol is supposed to be. But I think one of the things that, that we do here, we sort of take pride in is um, taking a close look on what that intended implementation is supposed to be and reconciling it with the code. Um, and sometimes even within that intended implementation, um, it can have implica implications that may not have been foreseen by the designers. Um, it can be potentially manipulated in certain ways and create behaviors that might be undesirable to them. Um, so one of the things that we do, which really helps with this process is having that, that daily communication with our clients. So when we come across things that might result in behaviors that might be, um, we might be concerned about, uh, we just immediately open up that line of communication and, and start the dialogue with the client. Um, and sometimes that can result in um, sort of modifications to a design um, that ultimately gets translated to changes in the code. So um, hopefully that answers your question, but if it doesn't, uh, let me know. So, well, I, I... I don't think it answers the question. If you find a, a, an unintended behavior or something weird, you would have to explain why uh, this is an intended and, and again, which specification it violates. The other thing that I'm a bit worried about is uh, you find the bug and you say, oh yeah, we're going to propose a fix and modify the code. How do you know that it doesn't introduce a new bug that would violate another specification? Yeah, so I guess, I need to be clear in my first response. So um, if we do find something that does violate their specification, then we would communicate that to them as a concern. Uh, the last thing we want is the code implemented to deviate from what people on the business side are expecting. Does that make sense? To the second question, which was, oh yes. So anytime you're giving um, a fix, you cannot do it in isolation. You have to do it with regards to its implications for the rest of the protocol. So we don't look at fixing one problem in isolation. We look at what the impact of that fix is gonna be for every, the rest of the protocol. Um, and that just sort of falls into the time I spent earlier on the manual coding review stuff where we're trying to build up that holistic picture of how the whole protocol works. Um, so that's why it's super important to have that SOP, to have that branch coverage and have um, sort of the manual code review process where you're really focusing on building up that mental model or that parallel computational model of how the protocol works. Um, so that when you see differences from the intended implementation, or where you see bugs and you're going to suggest fixes for them, um, you're sort of like readily positioned to consider and have that discussion around what the implications of what those fixes are going to be. Because um, in our eyes, if you are suggesting a fix that creates another problem, um, that's not a fix. So, yeah. So, thank you there, Oliver. Um, Mark, I can see your hands up. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I was, most of your comments have been about uh, looking at smart contract audits specifically. I was just curious if you get much interest in um, or have any thoughts on doing audit of, of kind of off-chain security architecture or cross-chain protocols? Yeah, I would say 
Cross-chain protocols is one of our bread and butter. Um, we've done a ton of audits for layer zero um, wormhole that happened um, after the incident that they experienced, uh, which is actually something I'll touch on tangentially uh, later in the slide. Um, Off-chain stuff, that's definitely not an area of my special uh, expertise, but um, we've done a lot of sort of, um, you know, our background is is competitive hacking. so. We were the global number one ranked team in the CTF circuit for 2020 and 2021. So, um, and we also did a lot of bug bounty programs. So hacking Fortune 500 companies, um, hacking operating systems, hacking Android phones and iPhones. So um, that's all stuff that's sort of like within our range of capabilities. But in terms of how we operate the business, uh, we tend to focus more on the smart contract side. Um, and if required, uh, we can also offer additional support for, for other stuff. Is, have you seen any kind of good tooling for for off-chain or cross-chain um, analysis? Good tooling? What, what do you mean by good tooling? Like Slither like, is just for a, a smart contract, but uh, any other automation? Personally, I haven't, um, but somebody on the team might have. I, I actually haven't done any of the uh, cross-chain audits. So yeah. Okay, thanks. Dedicated team to that. I can see, Root, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I had a question about um, when producing, what are some of the best practices that you've seen in terms of how a protocol would be able to provide a clear specification um, so that an audit can go more smoothly? Are there any uh, best practices or standards industry-wide um, that say, you know, they should have these properties and these properties and these types of functions to be clearly laid out or anything like that. What have you seen and um, what would you say are like best practices around that? So, so the best practices around presenting documentation and I guess around the, the knowledge transfer for if I, if, if, if someone is producing a, a, a protocol and they want to be able to make sure that the auditors have all the tools that they need, what yeah. would be what would be the things that you're looking for that if you, you know, if, if this, if that information was laid out uh, to you guys, you'd be able to uh, have clear guidelines or, or clear guidance in terms of where you should be looking and, and how things should work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... We have not seen sort of like any group come together to establish like best practices for that. Um, it's definitely something that is, you know, as an auditing firm sort of challenging to, we don't really want to take the position of trying to enforce that upon anyone because doing it to what I would think would be, um, let's say the outcome of a meeting of minds to kind of determine the best practices would be quite an onerous procedure. Um, and a lot of these protocols are looking to, to launch quickly. Um, there's startups, limited resources. So there's always sort of the cost benefit considerations that protocols need to make in terms of how much time to put into creating these documentation for us to review. Um, that being said, I think you kind of touched on it in the formulation of the question in terms of what we would most like to see there, um, you know, and really you can just sort of take documentation to its extreme. Um, and that would be, you know, for every function, um, we'd like to see a description of what that function is expected to do uh, with the just descriptions of the parameters, uh, basically what their impacts on the function are gonna be, um, the different state states of the contract, what functions are gonna be interacting with them. Um, so sometimes we see stuff that approaches that. Uh, we've definitely worked with a lot of really high quality protocols that, you know, have good, a combination of good inline code descriptions, as well as good sort of supporting documentation, um, oftentimes in the form of, you know, white papers is a start, but that's really kind of a bit um, high level. Um, stuff that's sort of like more, more technical in nature, like coding diagrams is, is also very useful. So. Uh, hopefully that helps. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Uh, I think that's enough questions for now. So back over to you, Oliver. Thank you. So 
I think this is going to be the second last section we touch on. And this is really sort of um, some preparatory measures to take um, when your project is up for audit. Um, so some of the questions that came up, like the most recent one, are going to be, um, I guess, sort of reiterated here. But um, at a high level, um, you know, what can you do to ensure you get the best security outcomes um, and also sort of also like cut down on costs for the audit um, and just sort of like create the best experience for everyone involved. So um, at a high level, there are some key steps. So following good design principles, um, looking for surface level bugs on your own time, um, that's sort of running automated tooling and doing uh, top-down approaches, um, using peer code reviews, um, putting in time and effort into documentation, um, testing is also huge. Uh, we have found many bugs uh, just by adding uh, simple test cases. Um, so that's something that really helps a lot. And also, you know, as an audit shop, we like to use um, pre-audit questionnaires to sort of start building that relationship with the client, um, start getting that discussion and that dialogue going, and um, also kickoff calls as well. So really the most important preparation for a smooth and successful audit it's going to happen long before the audit begins. So it really comes down to following good design principles. These include uh, reviewing existing protocols that share similar features and mechanics of your protocol, pulling the core ideas and taking the time to find harmonious ways to combine them. Prioritizing modularity is extremely key. Um, it really helps sort of like separate the different components of the audit and really, as someone who did development for a long time, um, I think this is probably one of the most beautiful aspects of coding. Um, it's really sort of finding ways to separate your ideas and your concepts, um, writing them down into different, you know, solidity files or contracts, um, and that's just find like finding like an uh, basically like an efficient way to sort of um, mentally represent an ex extremely complicated process it really, really seems to require leveraging modularity. Um, and that of course circles back into doing an effective audit. Um, so inheritance is also good. It's definitely a useful concept, um, but it's important to use inheritance, uh, really only in the right amounts. Um, one of the things that can be a challenge for audits is, you know, coming across extremely deep inheritance hierarchies or structures, and then having, let's say, um, combining that with complicated branches. Um, so you're looking through a given contract, uh, con con control can get past the different internal functions and those can like lie at different places in, in the inheritance tree. Um, and that can create um, sort of like indicated in the lower left there, um, some, some complexities to deal with in terms of tracking the control flow. So um, taking limits to, to limit that, that branch branches and control flow and, uh, you know, cyclomatic complexity, um, is extremely important. So I guess why this is important. I've kind of touched on that. Um, you know, when we go through the audit, we're looking at the whole structure. Um, so we're going to really do our best effort to search through all of those branches and all of that coverage. Um, and if it's extremely complicated, sort of, and this might be something that, that comes up as a question is, is from a pricing standpoint. So um, when we're looking at an audit to do pricing, um, complexity is a huge factor because when you start to think about all these broad branches, they basically open up sets of possibilities or extremely sort of like complex possibility trees that our auditors are gonna need, going to need to work through. Um, and that's just going to um, contribute to the amount of computations and calculations that they need to do um, and so that's going to eat up engineer time and add to the, to the length of the engagement. But I think sort of core to this is, you know, taking the time to design a protocol well is going to avoid situations where bugs are found that are essentially impossible to fix without completely reworking the design. And this ties into a question, um, earlier about, you know, what happens if you're going to suggest a fix that's going to introduce another problem. So when we see, you know, serious oversights in the design of protocol, that's where we really run into situations where it's like, oh, you might see one fix um, that's going to sort of work in isolation, 
but because the protocol has sort of fundamental design issues, um, it's sort of impossible to make that fix within like the scope of a single function. And that's where you start to get into um, recommendations for fixes that require broader architectural changes. Um, and that's sort of getting shifting more from almost like um, serving as a security auditor to sort of serving more as like, um, like a development advisor. So those are definitely situations um, that everybody should try to avoid. So I guess one of the big complications there is if the fixes are too complicated to fix within sort of like in a reasonable amount of time, um, then one of the challenges there is that, you know, projects can have to come up for audit, which um, is going to, of course, extend their timeline for launch or um, can create sort of other challenges for them. So. I guess it's super important also to get, you know, the really easy stuff out of the way. Um, so, like I said, you know, we highly encourage uh, projects and we see this a lot. Actually, we work with some really great customers as they run a lot of the automated tools on their own. Um, this is going to really sort of like tie into what they should be doing, which is getting the easy stuff out of the way. Um, and that's just going to allow us more time to focus on the harder stuff. Um, and of course, we can sort of take that into consideration when scoping out the, the length of the engagement, given that um, it can take some some of the onus off of our, our plate. Um, sort of getting back into the culture stuff. Um, I mentioned about the culture on the auditing side. There's also really important considerations to make about the culture on the engineering side. So um, auditors should be, I mean, sorry, engineers should work in pairs. Uh, we encourage them to be asking questions about the security, integrity of other people's works. Um, and really sort of like adopting the mindset of, you know, uh, protecting the protocol over your ego. I think one of the challenges that can come up in sort of any sort of like um, highly intellectual space is uh, sort of getting attached to um, building things that sort of, uh, I don't want to say make you look smart, but really sort of like show the comp complexity of your thought process. Um, and we find that sort of across the board in our experience, really focusing on keeping things super simple as possible is going to result in sort of functions, uh, protocols rather that are sort of easy to extend and build upon in the future, uh, but of course, uh, easy to audit as well. So um, just touching back on the points on documentation, like I mentioned, um, we found a ton of cool bugs just by taking the time to reconcile what's in a design spec with an implementation, like what's in the actual code base, um, and also coming across scenarios where um, people on the business side are expecting the protocol to do one thing, um, and in fact, it's going to do another. So, you know, that has obviously serious implications for, um, you know, let's say they're expecting to change a certain parameter and expecting it to change the behavior of a protocol in a certain way, and it's not in fact going to do that, or they're expecting user interactions to go one way and they in fact go another. Um, well, it might not necessarily result in a loss of funds or let's say a denial of service or something. Um, it's certainly a horrible surprise in there. And so we try our best to to avoid that situation. Um, but I think sort of beyond that, having documentation really just gives auditors another representation of what a code base does. And this just helps us better understand um, the implementation. So we're really trying to, trying to get as many viewpoints um, and perspectives and discussion points on the code base that we're looking at as possible. And that's just going to help us get up to speed as fast as we can. So um, yeah, like I said, some of the docs that we like to get, white papers, light papers, code diagrams, readme files. We, we always read readme files. They are great, great things to include. Um, and any sort of like, let's say requests for, for changes um, that have occurred sort of within the development process can also be very useful as well. Sometimes being able to sort of dig back and see the lineage of the protocol on the development side um can help us sort of understand it and, and point to interesting things so um getting to test cases yeah so like i said many times a uh, single test case for each uh function um sometimes we see protocols being referenced as having complete coverage uh, but we only see one test for each function uh we like to see sort of at least three categories of test cases uh, and often numerous tests within each category. So these include positive cases, like does the function actually work when it's supposed to? Negative cases, these should sort of address cases where the function should fail. And also test cases covering a range of parameter values and contract states. So an important thing here is to just sort of think back to 
the stuff on branch coverage, um, having, so you can imagine if you have a high order function, calling various internal functions, depending on the parameters that are passed into it or the state of the contract. Um, ideally, you're gonna wanna see test cases that sort of cover all of those possibilities. Of course, sometimes there's some sort of, there's some modularity to this. Um, so you can also sort of make considerations about, you know, modularity and functional functions uh, as you can with sort of like the modularity of the test cases corresponding with those functions. So um, yeah, try to take that into consideration as well. So um, I think sort of like the last slide here is gonna be about um, prepping for the audit. So just some, some sort of basic questions that we like to have. A lot of this stuff is sometimes available um, in documentation, um, but in cases where we don't get good documentation, it's especially useful at the every, at the start of every engagement to get good summaries of the protocol. So we want to know its purpose, um, its inspiration and innovation. So let's say which protocols it's drawing from, which ideas it's drawing from, and how it's innovating or modifying those ideas, um, especially sort of the key functionalities here. We also want to know um, what are the project's bugs of major concern? Um, where is the key business logic within the protocol? Like where should our attention and focus be? Uh, and which contracts and, and how are those contracts interacting? Um, also, you know, specifically like super important is to know which functions control the funds and service availability. Um, but I think one of the things we really like to do here is sort of just get an idea of, you know, what's gonna keep the users, developers and investors up at night. But we wanna make sure that that's stuff that we investigate um, and also oftentimes it's really appreciated when we include that in the report. So everybody kind of knows that their concerns have been addressed during the process. So in terms of uh, post audit outcomes, okay, this is going to be the final section of the talk. So maybe before I get into it, maybe just one last chance to get questions in on that last section and then we'll move on. Uh, Rude, you've got a question over to you. Yeah, I had a question about uh, the architecture of uh, of the contracts. How often does the uh, like, for example, how often have you audited a, a system and looked at the overall architecture of how the um, protocol is implemented and found that to be a key uh, source of vulnerability as a whole? And what are the you know, are, are there any best practices around uh, good architecture um, in order to, you know, ensure that one, the 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 contracts themselves are easy to test um, and uh, clear in terms of how they work and function? Yeah, so I think to maybe to decompose that a little bit, um, we are always looking at architectural integrity across all the protocols that we audit in terms of sort of like the frequency of seeing protocols um, that have architectural challenges. Um, we work with really high quality clients, so um, it's not that common. In terms of best practices, I think the the, the points that I mentioned earlier around modularity, um, limiting, limiting inheritance, um, but also sort of just, I think I think the best approach is, is in, in most cases, you know, um, Innovation typically takes the form of an increment on something that already exists. Um, and in most cases, you can sort of find um, an example of something out there that has already been audited, has already sort of been battle tested, and um, you sort of like want to kind of leverage um, the past experience of that protocol and find a way to sort of, um, I guess, sort of elegantly include um, your modifications or extensions to it. Um, yeah, let me know if that helps. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And I think that's the only question we have around um, the pre-audit. So let's move to the next section. Okay, great. So yeah, post-audit outcomes, there are activities and then there are outcomes. So on the activity side, you have uh, suspicious transaction monitoring, you have audit drift and you have bug bounty programs. On the outcome side, you have successful protocols and you have um, protocols which unfortunately can, can be exploited. So on the suspicious transaction monitoring side, um, I'm sure everyone's heard this a million times. You know, once a contract is deployed, it's out in the wild. 
So it's therefore really important to uh, consider monitoring for suspicious behavior. Um, you know, like the most sort of like easiest to understand example is like monitoring for uh, large movements of funds. Um, another key consideration here are contract upgrades um, and audit drift basically. So audit drift happens when the code is on chain, um, it's modified through an upgrade um, and therefore does not match the code that was audited. So that's an indication of a change in the behavior of the code. Um, it could potentially introduce a bug and or it could also be an indication of uh, malicious behavior on the side of the protocol managers. So I think there was a question there earlier about um, centralization risk. Um, so how do you define centralization risk? Um, maybe I'll sort of leave that to the end, but this would sort of be an example of, um, you know, one centralization risk that kind of, that could occur, and it wouldn't necessarily constitute like a high or a critical vulnerability because you see it all the time. Um, you know, protocol managers need to be able to make changes to the state of the contract. They need to be able to upgrade it. Um, they need to be able to make, let's say, parameter changes, and and some protocol designs uh, call for more frequent interaction. Um, so, sort of like from the reporting standpoint. Uh, we feel our duty is really to sort of like communicate what the implications of those sort of more um, manager controlled functions can be to the dev team itself so that everyone there is aware of it. Um, they can sort of therefore ensure that those functions are properly safeguarded through uh, multi-sigs or different measures, um, but also for people on the uh, user side to know as well. Um, just important for them to have a good understanding of the trust that they're putting into the the dev team uh, when it comes to uh, managing that contract. So um, another thing that that program should look out for and something we definitely like to dig into from the centralization risk standpoint is, um, you know, understanding critical protocol parameters that can be changed by protocol managers. Um, let's say protocol management have the ability to uh, modify collateralization thresholds. Um, and a lot of lending pro protocols, if you were to able to change those thresholds on the fly, um, that could result in the pot potential for mass liquidation across the, the, le the lending protocol. Um, so that's definitely stuff that users should be aware of. So, okay, so getting to bad audit outcomes. Um, definitely sometimes protocols get hacked and sometimes the funds are gone and you're out of luck. Um, so, you know, I think one of the biggest examples out there was the Ronin hack, and that was related to, to private keys, if I recall correct, correctly. Um, but other times you can get lucky and reverse hacking is possible. Um, so this is sort of touching back on the um, reference to wormhole earlier. Um, so they lost about a little over 300 million. And I think, I'm not sure on the proportion of these funds that were deposited in an Oasis multi-sig, but it was definitely a considerable amount. And um, some white hack hackers were uh, able to collaborate and they basically reverse exploited a previously unknown weakness in the design of the admin process around this multi-sig and were able to retrieve um, some of the funds. So pretty sort of cool and exciting aspect of, of the whole sort of um, hacking dynamic in Web3 there. Um, but we are, we are seeing sort of like more frequently, like in the case of Euler, where, um, you know, protocols are recognizing that it's important to be able to negotiate with hackers and provide them bug bounties. But I think sort of like a key, a key element of smart contract security in Web3 are having good bug bounty programs. Um, these really help in avoiding those high profile exploits. And those cases where you're negotiating with hackers on chain, um, avoiding negotiating with hackers on chain obviously avoids market panic with users and protocol owners. Um, it just removes that fear moment when funds suddenly disappear. It also incentivizes white hack hackers. Um, sorry, sorry. So, but a critical component of this is to like properly incentivize white hack hackers to not go the route of. Um, you know, doing a hack, whether they're going like full black hat and they're not going to return any of the funds or they're wanting to sort of take a power position and sort of negotiate with the protocol. Um, it's super important for bug bounty programs to be streamlined and fair. 
So, you know, you can just imagine yourself, you're a hacker, you are in a position where you could um, take $10 million and instead somebody is offering you 10 K. Um, it's definitely, I could definitely see how some hackers might not feel that they're getting properly compensated for the value they would be adding to the protocol if they were to report that $10 million vulnerability through a bug bounty program. Um, also, there's been sort of like known challenges with doing bug bounties, um, cases where someone has reported a bug and the team says it's not a real bug um, or that they were just about to patch it. So um, these are the type of things that could cause, you know, really talented people in the space to go rogue. Um, and that's really the last thing we want to see. So having fair bug bounty programs, uh, they definitely play a key role in keeping the best uh, hacking talent on the right side of things um, and add to the overall safety of the industry. So yeah, um, this is going to be the last slide. Just want to thank everyone for listening to my talk um, and hope it gave some insight into um, audit services you might be getting now or in the future. And um, yeah, thanks for your time, guys. Okay, so thank you. Um, so I know we've, we've had a few um, questions. Um, so one of the questions was around if you were, you know, new to auditing or interested in becoming an auditor, how would you, what, what process do you think people should follow to try and, you know, become some auditor person? Yeah, no, that's a really easy answer for that. So Stephen, um, as I mentioned, our CEO and co-founder wrote an article called The Auditor Grind Set. Um, that article is available to read on our website. And that pretty much outlines the steps that we think um, anybody could follow if they want to get into the security space. Um, so I can post that in a chat in a second, uh, but sort of really um, at a high level, um, having um, having like a good background in software development is super key. Um, and sort of being able to, to transition that into um, Smart co contract language is sort of is sort of obvious. So, um, getting familiar with sort of the, the Solidity manual, um, being a good Solidity dev, building things simple things in Solidity, um, doing sort of like a bunch of hacking challenges. Like we have a damn vulnerable DeFi is a great one out there. Um, really touches on some cool um, economic exploits. But I think sort of like. Um, I think there's sort of like two key things which are super important to being a good auditor. One of them is being, it's 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 a bit of like a mindset difference from being a builder. Like when you're a builder and you're a developer, you really want to focus on building something new and you have to focus on delivering that thing. So if you're the type of person who thinks about all the possible ways that, that can go wrong, um, as a builder, you might sort of be stifled and suffer from paralysis, like, what is it called? Paralysis from analysis. Um, but those types of people actually make really good auditors. So, um, so people who are sort of have that desire to think about all the possible ways that can go wrong, but are also people who are really aware of their blind spots and weaknesses. So like one of the things that can happen, especially when you're, when you're learning to audit, um, the thing you want to sort of like develop is it's kind of like, your spidey sense, but really it's just like an awareness of where you have not spent sufficient time thinking through something. So when you're sort of learning through the process, you're going to go, you might have like a, like, a, like a hacking challenge. Maybe you don't solve it. And maybe you sort of like find out the answer. Maybe you look at the answer and it sort of like gives you some insight into like, okay, what did I miss there? Like, you know, did some level, did at some level, I have an intuition that this is the thing that was wrong. And then it's like, if you're going to be an auditor, like typically you will have had that intuition and you'll be like, okay, I kind of knew that at some level, that's the thing I was missing. Then you're going to go to the next hack. And then it's like, you want to make sure that when you have that intuition, um, you just dig into it. And so it's sort of like really sort of like building up on that process um, and being as exhaustive as you can. So um, yeah, hopefully that helps. A little complicated answer. That's okay. Um... So there's another question in chat, but I've got a question of my own that I thought of before Frank had his question there. So I'm going to ask my question next. And that is, all right, so I've got V, say, three of a protocol and say um, Zelikov uh, reviewed V3. 
yeah. um, to produce, say, V3.1 or V4 of the protocol, mm -hmm. what are the advantages and disadvantages of having, say, a different company review it versus Zelic review it for, you know, that upgrade? Okay, so so I'm just going to repeat the question to make sure I understand it. So Zelic did a V3, uh, V3 audit, total audit of the complete code base. And then the question is, somebody's going to be doing an upgrade to, let's say, a V4, and should they be going with us for that audit or somebody else? Yeah. Yeah. Is it, yeah. What, what are the advantages? Uh, you know, like, because I, I mean, naively, I think, you know, a different set of eyes, maybe they'll find different things, but then there's familiarity with the code base. So maybe that makes the audit cheaper, but are there other things beyond the naive view? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think like, that's sort of like, those are sort of like the main driving factors there. Um, like, in most cases, we see where protocols have had an auditor do a V2 and they're looking to get a V3. If they had a really good experience with that auditor and they're convinced that that auditor has a good understanding of their code base and they like working with them, um, typically we'll see them go with the V3. Um, just because you're able to sort of leverage that past experience with it. Um, you have good communication with them. The devs and the auditors have typically already built rapport. So there's a lot of sort of like other synergies there that are going to contribute to um, a successful view of the V3. And then, of course, you have those, you know, sort of like reduced time and the extent of the engagement because you already have that built-in familiarity. Um, so typically on our side, we see people come back with us. Um, but that being said, you know, it's super important within the process of auditing to have multiple pairs of eyes, different audit shops, look at your code base. Um, so, yeah, I don't think there's any sort of black yeah. or white, answer, black or white right. answer, but yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, so before I go and talk about the merch store, Frank's got one other question here, which is, what is a good auditor? You know, is there a way to measure how good an auditor someone or some company is? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I guess there's sort of like, yeah, so like the simplest way of looking at this is like the practical standpoint. And like, I think oftentimes in life when you're dealing with practicalities, like you're dealing with relative performance, um, because you're making a decision between the options you have available to you, not the options that exist in an ideal world. So um, a great way to look at it or a great way to measure the quality of an auditor is, you know, are they able to find bugs that other auditors have missed? And are those bugs critical to the functioning and security and safety of the protocol? Um, that's sort of like um, a pretty strong metric. I think another metric would be, has this auditor or these auditing firms, are they consistently hacked? And do they consistently miss things? That's definitely not going to, um, that's not going to bode well, because they're just not going to have a good track record and that's going to point to sort of flaws in the, in the process. So that's sort of like more about um, measuring an auditor based on outcomes, of course, with outcomes in anything, especially with auditing processes, there are other factors that need to be considered, like, you know, what was the quality of the protocol going in? Um, and sort of what measures in place that they have in process to make sure that they weren't working with something that was sort of like, you know, absolutely doomed for failure. And did they, did they give the auditors on their team appropriate time to do the audit? So there's like, even on the outcome side where somebody might get hacked, you could also have considerations where you know, really skilled auditors um, were put in a time crunch. Um, we've definitely seen cases where, you know, there's plenty of super talented people out there um, that have had bad outcomes and there are other factors I need to consider when going into that. So um, I think really what makes a good auditor is sort of stuff that I touched upon by having um, on the processes standpoint, which is being holistic. Mm -hmm looking at things sort of like from the ground up, from that beginner's mindset, not taking things for advantage. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, being well educated and well versed in the types of known hacks that are out there, um, so that they can identify those, but then of course also buy themselves more time during the audit engagement to focus on sort of more novel uh zero day type things, if you will. Yeah. And would you ever reject, you know, like the would you you ever have a company come to you saying, hey, we'd like an audit? You look at the company and you say, this is too much of a train wreck of a protocol. The probability of this eventually being hacked is just too high. It's too big a risk. No, we're not going to audit you. Do, do you ever do that sort of thing? I think those cases may happen sort of implicitly. For example, if we were to get a code base that looked extremely shoddy and we were to sort of come up with the amount of time it would take us to do that audit in a reliable way. It could just be that the amount of time that we would need to feel comfortable auditing that protocol would just, you know, be out of line with whatever that client was expecting from a price standpoint. Yeah. Okay. I can see, Frank, you've got one la one question. I think we'll have your question as the last one for the talk. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just uh, went through uh, Frank's profile and so that I uh, haven't seen that before. Keen to give it a try. Not a question, uh, just a statement. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, the EVM Daphne project, I saw that in your profile. Is this something that you can use for formal verifications on smart yeah, contracts? I'm a formal verification and formal methods person. If it's not, if 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 it was not obvious, uh, that that's how it works. So, but my question is not about um, formal verification; is actually about the audits. So, uh, there was a question, Peter. You said, or someone asked, um, would you reject an audit saying that it's too risky and so on? I think the problem, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the result of a note in the, in the result of the audit or the report, you don't provide any guarantees. The report is a list of bugs that you've found, but you're unable to provide any guarantees that there's no, for instance, division by zero in the code or anything like that, right? So this is a question about if we started an engagement with a protocol. Well, that the question is, what guarantees do you provide? So a concrete one is, all right, I give you a code base to uh, to analyze. Yeah. Uh, uh, I will ask you at, at the end of the day, I would like to know whether there's a possible division by zero in the code. Can you provide some guarantees and sign off on it that there's no division by zero in the code? No possibility of a division by zero in the code. So I think this touches on something I mentioned in the slide, which was sort of like, the benefits that form of verification offers over the other audit approaches. So if you were to identify a specific component of the code base um, and then perform, sort of set up an invariant and then perform a form of verification on that, then you would be able to make claims like that. My question is, right, we are not talking about formal verification because you're doing manual verification. So my question- We also do formal verifications. So that can be an example of making a strong statement like that. So what kind of, uh, so, so then my question is, can you provide formal, or can you provide guarantees in your report when you an analyze the code? Is there a line saying we guarantee that there's no division by zero in the code? I think typically we do not make guarantees. Yeah, okay. So you find some bugs. And it's a non-deterministic process because it depends on the auditors. So depending on the different auditors, they can find or not find bugs. They could even find bugs that they would discuss together and think one is a bug and the other one would say, no, it's not a bug. So that seems to me um, uh, a good approach where you can start auditing. But uh, for instance, the statement and the assertion saying that uh, manual auditing uh, is um, is more reliable than formal verification. I think it's, uh, I should probably, I, I would disagree with it and say, don't. Yeah, don't, I mean, you may have problem. misheard, you may have misheard what I said there. So 
I said that the way manual code review works is different than the way um, formal verification works because a lot of the things that you can check and explore in the context of manual code review, um, you can't explore in the context of formal verification because you can't formally verify the complete business logic of a code base. You can't formally verify. I disagree with that. Of course you can. Okay, well, now we're going to have a discussion between practicalities and theory. You know, about practicalities, I think uh, it, it, it's a, well, we, we've, we're over time, but uh, I think that's a wrong statement and uh, uh, it should be corrected. You can provide formal guarantees about the business logic using formal verification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. logic, but there, uh, sorry, just, there's some simple requirements like must be usable, right? For example, right? So, and, and you can test that in a lab. You can either, um, you know, you can test the time it takes for users on average to find, click a shopping cart button or whatever, right? So you can do a usability review and you can get a definitive outcome statistical, but you can't do a formal verification of is this website usable? I mean, that, that, right. that, okay, but I agree. So they they complement each other. No, but that, that's a big misunderstanding. I think it, it, it's not what formal verification is about. So maybe that's a, for another yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm saying it's different things, right? They complement each other because it that's might be for have thing, no yeah. divide by zeros, but might not meet a business yeah. need. But of it's a <laughs> that you would like to verify. So I think it's a. Yeah. And there are lots of projects using formal verification, the move length. Well, they, I think they said they, they do do it. It's just not, you're not an expert, right? In, in, in this, um, whoever yeah. the presenter is, yeah. is not an expert I mean, on that, but there are other I mean, people in the company that yeah, yeah, will yeah. do that. And also, and also, I think I think one sort of, sort of really way to think about this from a practical standpoint is, let's say you want to formally verify everything in a protocol. Well, in order to fair, formally verify everything in a protocol, you need to basically do a complete manual code review in order to figure no, out all. No, 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 no. Oh, no. Excuse me. Sorry. Can I finish? I, I need, need, um, okay, but I'm just going to finish my point, and then you can make yours. You would need to basically review the entire behavior of the protocol to consider possible all the possible ways it can go wrong, and then in addition to that, you need to set up all the invariants in order to test that. So one of the things I mentioned earlier in my slide is um, sort of like, you know, how long is that going to take for the engagement? and what's going to be the cost of that engagement. Um, so that's sort of looking at it, giving a lot of favor to what's possible in the formal verification space. That being said, um, I feel when it comes to sort of the more complicated business logic um, that there are limitations there. And, and that's something that um, sort of I've learned from talking with some of the leaders in the formal verification space. So, uh, yeah. but I'll leave it at, I'll leave it at that. Uh, yeah, look, and I, I think, it, it's yeah. It's all about the definition as much as anything else of what's practical, um, yeah, and what people are prepared to pay for. Maybe that's that, that's it. Well, look. Um, so thank you, Oliver. That was a great talk, and um, I think we maxed out at thirty-four people online, which is um, a, a obviously very well attended talk. So people have asked. Uh, many questions as well. So that's also a very good sign. So thank you very much for your time and effort of putting that talk together. And um, yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate the great questions, guys. Have a great week. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, talk to everyone later. Bye-bye.